Okay, gentlemen, if you do have your workbooks, we're on actually page eight of part two, which is called The Laws. I said, oh, the, uh, the critical question really is, <laughs> as New Testament Christians, are we still bound by the laws of God, especially in the Old Testament? Now, I'm sure you're aware that there are many groups who still believe that the Old Testament laws still apply to us. You've got groups like Jehovah Witnesses and others that still believe in practicing Old Testament laws. Some of the Adventists uh, will tell you, someone will tell you, actually, you've got to follow the Old Testament laws. So is that really true? I mean, are these laws binding upon us, us today? All of them? Or maybe some of them. So we'll kind of go through a workbook here. We're going to look at several scriptures. The Old Testament contains, believe it guys, over 600 commandments. Only four of the 39 Old Testament books contain these laws. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These are the books that are referred to as the law. So the most difficult problem for most Christians is how to deal, how do, how do we deal with these legal laws? Do they apply to us today? So if you're a Christian, are you expected to keep the Old Testament law? If you are expected to keep it, then how can you possibly do so? Since there is no longer any temple, there's no central sanctuary on whose altar you can offer animal sacrifices. In fact, if you were to kill or burn animals as described in the Old Testament, you'd probably be arrested for cruelty to animals. But if you're not supposed to observe the Old Testament law anymore, then why would Jesus say, Matthew 5, 18, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So that kind of produces some kind of a conundrum, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, we got this Old Testament law, so it's, it's impossible for us to even follow it today. Yet Jesus goes on record to say that not one letter of this law will ever be dissolved. So how do we explain that? Any ideas? We're all asleep this morning? <laughs> well, essentially, the, yeah, the law is never going to go away. Okay, There are elements of law. It's still God's word. Now, some of it may still apply to us. Some of it may not. But keep in mind that we'll get into a little bit later. The, the Old Testament, what's the, the word for testament is covenant. Okay, So the Old Testament was an old covenant. What's a covenant? Uh, it's a bond, right? Yeah, a bond or an agreement. Yeah. So the Old Testament was an agreement between God and who? Man. Israel. 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 Okay, the, the Jews. What's the New Testament? It's a covenant for who? Us. Christians. So you've got, you've got a, a binding law for the Jews, and then you've got a binding law for the Christians. And there is some, some lapping over there. So we need to follow six guidelines for understanding the relationship of Christians to the old law. Number one, like we just said, the Old Testament law is a covenant. Covenant is a binding contract between two parties both of whom have obligations specified in the covenant. In return for benefits and protection, Israel was expected to keep more than 600 commandments contained in the covenant of law, as found in Exodus chapter 20, all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 3. So this was an agreement between God and Israel. Secondly, the Old Testament is not our New Testament. Okay? Testament is just another word for covenant. The Old Testament represents the Old Covenant, which, which is one we are no longer obligated to keep. We have to assume that none of its stipulations are binding upon us unless they are renewed in the New Covenant. Unless the Old Testament law is somehow restated or reinforced in the New Testament, it is no longer directly binding on God's people. Somebody look up Romans 6, verses 14 and 15. In fact, while one of you doing that, I'm going to give you three, a couple other verses. Uh, uh, I got the first one. That's all right. Uh, Greg, look up Matthew twenty-two forty. Mike, Deuteronomy six five. We'll get to those in just a little bit. Okay, Dan, you're looking up Romans six verses fourteen and fifteen. Ready when you are. Go ahead. Yes. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. Okay, now here's you got a, a very popular old New Testament scripture. You know, we, we are no longer under the law, but we are under grace. So Paul's argument here, that, does that mean we have a right to sin? No, of course not. We need to understand that there are parts of the law we are still bound to. And just because we're not no longer bound to the Old Testament law doesn't mean we're free to sin. Believe it or not, there was this doctrine 
during the New Testament era in some of the churches, and the doctrine still exists today among some people that think they can freely sin because we are under grace. Uh, I, I, I think I told the story before, but there was a, a pastor in the town where I pastored, and he, and he believed this completely. Once you were saved, you could still sin because you're forgiven. And he bragged about the fact, oh, I've got prostitutes in my church, and oh yeah, they, they're saved, and they're all going to heaven. So you've got those that believe, well, we're under grace now, so once, once you go to Christ and ask Christ to forgive you, that, that's it, you're done. You're guaranteed entrance into heaven, no matter what you do. You kill somebody, and he was adamant, oh yeah, that's fine, because as long as you came to Christ, you're, you're still going to heaven. But that's not what the Bible teaches. So we want to go through some of these laws. There have been changes from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. God expects his people, us, somewhat different evidences of obedience and loyalty from those which he expected from the Old Testament Israelites. The loyalty itself is still expected. It is how one shows that loyalty that has been changed in certain ways. So, like thirdly, some stipulations of the Old Covenant had clearly not been renewed in the New Covenant. These are the Israelite civil laws and the Israelite ritual laws. Those laws were never again repeated in the New Testament. We are not bound by those laws. The civil laws are those that specify penalties for various crimes for which one might be arrested or tried in Israel. Such laws only apply to the citizens of Israel. No one living today is a citizen of ancient Israel. So we have the old laws, punishment for crimes, that apply to them there. They don't apply today. The ritual laws constitute the largest block of Old Testament laws. These told the people of Israel how to carry out the practice of worship, detailing everything from the design of the implements of worship to the priest's responsibility to what kinds of animals should be sacrificed and how. Without the shedding of blood, no forgiveness of sins was possible. That's repeated in Hebrews 9.22. So when Jesus once and for all was once and for all was sacrificed, he accomplished that, and the old covenant, old covenant was at that point outdated, no longer applied. And we've got to remember, the reason why Christ came, he became the sacrificial lamb, which means we no longer offer sacrifice. So we're not bound to that law. Ah, page 10. But didn't Jesus say that we're still under the law, since no jot or tittle would ever drop out of the law? Well, the answer is no. What he said in Luke 16 was that the law cannot be changed. The law and the prophets came to an end with the arrival of John the Baptist. Jesus gave a new law which did not abolish the old but fulfilled it. So you need to understand that, that the New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament law. So a lot of this law not only not, no longer applies because Jesus Christ came and fulfilled that law so we're no longer bound to it. It doesn't erase it. It's still there. It is still history. This is what God demanded then, but now we're a different generation. So, fourthly, part of the Old Covenant is actually renewed in the New Covenant. Some aspects of the Old Testament ethical law are actually restated in the New Testament as being applicable to Christians. Who did I give Matthew 22, 42? Is that you, Greg? 42? I mean, Matthew 22, verse 40. On these two commandments hang all, all the law and the prophets. Jesus, how can David call his descendants Lord? Who did I get Deuteronomy 6, 5? Mike? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Okay, those are the commandments. He said those still apply. These are the greatest commandments of all, the fact that we're loving one another and that we're loving God. Now, Jesus uses the Old Testament law, gives them new ap applicability. Matthew 5, I'll read those in a minute, by redefining them to include more than their original scope. So I want you to listen to this as I read it here. Let me open it up. Uh, okay, Matthew Five verses 21 down. Now, he's repeating the law, but he's, how am I going to say, he's kind of adding to it a little bit, okay? So the law is being repeated, but he's explaining it in greater detail. So here, here he says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause is in danger of judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And notice there's a little bit uh, stronger here. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar 
and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar. Go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, then come back and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penalty. And it goes on. Let's go down, uh, continue on. You have heard it said, and again he's saying, you the law says. Notice what he's doing. He's actually making the law stronger. He's going a little bit further. You've heard, you shall not commit adultery. Yeah, but I tell you, you look at a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it away. It is more profitable for you that you that one of your members perish than for all your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you. It is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. I'm going to go down to 48. Furthermore, again, again, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her, give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. You don't hear that preached anymore because we live in a society where everybody's getting divorced and remarried. But again, this, this is serious stuff. We'll go back over it in a minute. Again, he says, verse 33, you've heard. You've heard it to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, it's his footstool, not by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, your no be no, for whatever is more than these, is from the evil one. Now, you've heard it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go two. Give to him and ask you, and from who who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. A few more verses. You have heard it was said, you shall love your enemy, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You understand now, he, he didn't eliminate parts of these laws. He elaborated on them. I mean, uh, on the sins. And like, you, know, you go back to whether well, it's divorce or, or committing adultery, uh, dealing with your thoughts. He says, you know, and the point is, is he making the point, sin is not just the act of doing something wrong. Sin is also the process of thinking about doing something wrong. And that's probably where we struggle the most today, especially in the, such an evil world and being confronted with so much evil and, and things like that. The fact that we've got to remind that our mind is the problem. And you go into James, and again, when we ever get to James, uh, James talks about the very fact that sin begins with the thought. If you didn't think about it, you wouldn't have done it. And if you didn't do it, you still thought about it. And so he makes the law harder than it ever was. And I, and I know, even in, in the pastorate, and uh, we, we struggle with some things because there, people try to get around the law, especially divorce and remarriage. Now, the Bible does allow divorce in the sense of, of sexual immorality. And the whole meaning of that, if it is a perpetual thing, it doesn't mean your spouse suddenly has an affair and then Paul would, no, we're, we're told to forgive. But if there is this constant pattern, then Paul makes it very clear that it is the unsaved that broke the marriage relationship, not you. And Paul says to the believer, you are now free, which means you are free to marry. But 
Here, here's what I've been bothered about, and uh, I don't know if it bothers other pastors, but it is legal, scripturally acceptable, to get a divorce on the grounds of immorality. But do you know anybody who's got a divorce on the grounds of immorality? Nobody does. It's uh, irreconcilable differences. They, they don't go that route because you have to prove it. So in my mind, and this is my question, is really, so therefore, these people who get a divorce based on unreconcilable differences, and then they get married, are they committing adultery? What do you think, Mike? I have a question for you. Yeah. Moses' law of uh, stupid of divorcement, does the law override that with that statement? With those statements? No, but I think. It, oh, you know, well, I know what you're saying. The, the, yeah, the law required you give there has to be in writing, yeah. but that's the same thing as getting a written divorce now today. It's in writing, yeah. and with Jesus, He makes it even harder. Okay. In fact, that the only legal legal reason scripturally is is is, is uh, okay. infidel. But there, there's another clause there too. I got to remember the fact that Paul does make it very clear. In fact, we. I know, I'm not going to mention any names, but I know a couple of people in the church where their spouse, once they got saved, their spouse wanted nothing to do with it. So like if, so if the unbeliever, you got a spouse that decides not to be a believer and they, and they initiate the divorce, Paul gets says, go, you're free, you're free. So again, the Christian is not bound if the other party breaks that bond for some reason, whether it's infidelity or the fact that I'm not going to live the Christian life, I don't want this anymore. And Paul says, you're, you're free in that sense. In that oh, sense. I'm just elaborating a little bit. One other, another question. Yeah. But that law that the recipient of divorcement basically could be any reason at all for the, for the man to get rid of the woman. He states basically, it's basically immorality. Yeah. So basically, do they, do they go together basically? Or one is, what does one override the other? I, I can't answer. I, my, my thinking is, even in the Old Testament, it was still immorality. Uh, that, 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 that's the only reason that, little, that Moses would give. And again, thank God made it clear. God didn't do this. Moses said, there, uh, well, there is a reason for you to get a divorce. So, and I think this was the reason. Or I think there were times when they married outside the faith. The law at that time would not allow that. So if you married a, a Hittite or a Canaanite, and you, you brought these idol worshipers in your family... Uh, there were times in Scripture, you, you've got to get rid of that family. You, so they're gone. You, so basically, you disobeyed God. And uh, what happens after that, I'm not sure. But uh, So Jesus just goes a little bit further. And, and the same thing with, um, you know, you heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, I say, you know, love your, love your enemies. Treat them with kindness. You know, go overboard with them. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna, they want to take some for it, give them a little extra. And of course, you've you got to understand in context of that time, too, especially during the Roman law in the New Testament, uh, a Roman soldier would come up to you and say, listen, carry this for a mile for me. And that was, as, that was as far as the law, the Roman law will allow them. So Jesus said, well, follow, go the extra mile, you know? And, and this was the way that they were demonstrating Christianity and the love of Christ by going a little bit further than normal. In other words, do a little bit more. Don't be like everybody else. Just... Add a little more to what you're doing here and let them know that we're not, we're not bad people. And so the law becomes, some of the law applies to us, some of it doesn't. Let's go on. Uh, number five, all the Old Testament law is still the word of God for us, even though it is not still the command of God to us. God wants us to know about these laws, even though they are not directed toward us. You know, the question is why? Again, we understanding God's ways. Only that which is explicitly renewed in the old, from the Old Testament law can be considered part of the New Testament law of Christ. Included in this category would be the Ten Commandments, since they are cited in various ways in the New Testament as still binding upon Christians. And the two great commandments from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. No other specific Old Testament laws can be proven to be strictly binding on Christians, valuable as it is for Christians to know all of these laws. So, since they, we know the Ten Commandments are repeated, we know the laws of love your, love your neighbor, love God, those are repeated, and those are explicitly stated. The rest of the laws are not repeated in the New Testament. So, go to chapter, page 11. The role of the law in Israel and in the Bible. 
It would be a big mistake to conclude that the law is no longer a valuable part of the Bible. It functioned in history, in the history of salvation to bring us to Christ, Galatians 3.24, by showing how high God's standards of righteousness are, how impossible it is for anyone to meet those standards apart from divine aid. And if we learn anything from the old law, it is realizing that it is impossible to follow. And this was God's point. You can't do it on your own. Therefore, the New Testament, we have grace now. We, we can't follow the law. It's inherently impossible. We're sinners. And so the grace of Christ helps us transcend some of that, and we, we have the ability for forgiveness. The law shows us how impossible it is to please God. When we read the Old Testament law, we ought to be humbled to appreciate how unworthy we are to belong to God. An example, you got the you got the food laws in the Old Testament. Okay? Now, there are those that will still cling to those, but you got to understand the reason for those laws were basically health reasons. They didn't have the sanitary situations we have now. This is why when you come to the New Testament, remember the, the, the vision of Peter? God all these unclean animals down. And God says, Peter, eat them. Well, I'm not going to eat those. Those are unclean. He says, no, nothing I created is unclean. So, Obviously, health standards have changed. Same thing with like, remember for years, you, you, pork had to be, you know, now you know, health standards have changed. So the, things aren't as bad for us today as they were back then. I mean, consider they had no refrigeration. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the, the animals then probably had diseases and whatnot. So they were, they were, they abstained from a lot of those animals. And uh, today, that's not the situation. We, we, our health standards have changed and there's nothing that's forbidden. Example, last week we had a we had squirrel out here, <laughs> you know, and it does taste like chicken. Okay, uh, so food laws, there were reasons for that. Unusual pro prohibitions, mainly identified with pagan practices. So some of the laws dealt with the fact that there were a lot of pagan practices going on that Israel was not to take part in, and we can actually apply those to us today because we do, <laughs> whether we go to bed or not, we live in a pagan society. And there are a lot of things going on that should not be allowed into our homes or into our places of business and government, but it's there. It is there. So some of those we need to take, we need to take note of. In summary, the do's and don'ts. Do see the Old Testament law as God's fully inspired word, word for you. Don't see the Old Testament law as God's direct commandment to you. Do see the Old Testament law as the basis for the Old Covenant and therefore for Israel's history. But don't see the Old Testament laws binding on Christians in the New Covenant except where specifically renewed. Do see God's justice, love, and high standards revealed in the Old Testament law. But don't forget to see God's mercy is made equal to the severity of the standards. Don't see the Old Testament law as complete. It is not technically comprehensive. Do see the Old Testament law as a paradigm, providing examples for the full range of expected behavior. Don't expect the Old Testament law to be cited frequently by the prophets or the New Testament. Do remember that the essence of the law, the Ten Commandments, and the two chief laws is repeated in the prophets, renewed in the New Testament. Do see the Old Testament law as a generous gift to Israel, bringing much blessing when obeyed. Don't see the Old Testament law as a grouping of arbitrary, annoying regulations limiting people's freedom. And that's basically what people see. When you talk about the laws of God, people see restrictions. And I still hear it today, especially in an age now where, again, quoting scripture, good is seen as evil and evil is seen as good. So the moment you start bringing up God's commands, uh, you know, the Bible is just so restrictive and we just can't abide by it, but, but we must. Any questions or comments? Any yet? Yeah, I thought that pastor is speaking thinking because he's saved uh, either way he wants. Yeah. That is a myth. Once saved, always saved. Oh, yeah. Because in the Bible, it does talk about you can't fall from the grace. Book of Exodus, Book of Deuteronomy. Book oh, yeah. In the New Testament, you figure every parable of Christ actually deals with this idea of falling away. Uh, the warnings are like, uh, once have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit and the fall away, the Bible is very clear, better you hadn't even been born. Uh, and the Bible does warn against backsliding. But yeah, it, so what it is, there are various groups, and 
Some of them on TV, people in the church listen to, and I don't, I don't get that, that are very strongly uh, in those beliefs, as well as anti-Pentecostal, anti-miracles, anti-healing. They will tell you this all was meant only for the New Testament area. It doesn't apply today. And eternal security, uh, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. And uh, I ran into this one situation. Uh, I've told the story before about the couple, but uh, they were married to other people. And suddenly decided that God said it was all right for them to marry each other. And I explained to them, no, that is wrong. It's sin. And I think I told them they had to leave the church. And they found another church. And the next thing they're telling people, hey, we found out now that we, that, that, that we can sin and still go to heaven. <laughs> and so as, as odd as that sounds, that is what eternal security teaches you. Once saved, always saved. You, you can't be unsaved. And that just just... Sorry, but that's just stupid thinking, okay? To think that, okay, I'm safe now. I can go back out and I commit all these crimes. I can still live in the sin. And the point of being a Christian is it's all about your lifestyle. If you're not living for Christ, you're not going to heaven. And I mean, you just read through the scriptures. Paul was very clear on this. He lists all the, if you do this, you don't go to heaven. You do this, you're going to hell. So, so the proof of your Christianity it's in your life. One of the old professors in Bible college, she made a statement I never forgot. And she simply said, salvation makes a difference. So if you haven't changed, you haven't been saved. And that is the bottom line. The proof, I say the proof is in the pudding. Uh, if you're still living the way you used to, then I'm sorry, you've, not, you've never been redeemed. You're, you're still going to hell. And it's, and people do not want to hear that. And I'm sure you're familiar with that, but you try to explain that to people and you just can't anymore. This is why Paul says in some cases, just back off. You know, when you're dealing with the unsafe and they don't want to hear it, Paul says, back off. All you're going to do is create an enemy. And uh, our best illustrations are always about Jesus. Jesus spent a whole lot of time with sinners. You understand that? But he never allowed them to affect him. And he, he was, he was our, always our example. He would say things that created questions from the other side, like the woman at the well, the greatest example of evangelism you'll ever have. If you only knew what I had. And of course, I said, well, what do you have? That's an open door, and it's learning to live our lives, even with our families. Little hints when somebody says something, little hints that'll, that'll elicit, elicit a question, and they want to know why. Oh, that's an open door to share the gospel, and that's... Uh, uh, that's, that, that hasn't been taught here in years. I, I've taught the class a couple of times, lifestyle evangelism, which is basically living your life in such a way that people want to know why you're different. And it's all about where we go, what we do, the friends we keep, the things, even the things we say no to. Those are the things that create questions and people want to know, well, what, what's so different about you? And that's an open door, okay. So that you ask, let me tell you my life story, okay. I remember the story told by uh, K Kennedy, uh, who actually wrote the uh, whole series on lifestyle evangelism many, many years ago. And he worked for uh, the uh, Arthur Murray, you know, the dance studios. And uh, somebody asked him a question one time, and it, it was, uh, if you died right now and stood at the pearly gates and God asked you, why should I let you into my heaven what would your answer be? Well, we think about it. What's the typical answer? Well, I'm just as good as anybody else. And like I said, that was my answer. And the guy says, well, that, you know, that's what I used to think. But that's not in the Bible. And this is what people don't know. That's not in the Bible. You can be as good as everybody. That doesn't get you into heaven. Uh, the fact is, unless you're born again, the Bible, except a man be born again, you, you can't see heaven. And uh, so it's, it's little things like that, 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 that pique people, people's interest and in saying little things like that. So, uh, any questions at all? What we've covered. The next session deals with the Gospels. Let's see. We got a, time to go through a few more pages here. Yeah, let's let's do it. We still got time. So, page number thirteen. Uh, the Gospels, one story, but many dimensions. The materials in the Gospels may be divided roughly into sayings and narratives. That is, teachings of Jesus and stories about Jesus. The nature of the Gospels is that almost all the difficulties one encounters in interpreting the Gospels come from two obvious facts. 
Number one, Jesus himself did not write a gospel. They came from others, not him. Secondly, there are four gospels. Why four? Well, we cannot give an absolute certain answer to this, but at least one of the reasons is a very simple one. Different Christian communities each had need for a book about Jesus. For a variety of reasons, the gospel written for one community or group of believers did not necessarily meet all the needs of another community. So the first one written was probably Mark. That gospel was rewritten twice by Matthew and Luke for considerably different reasons to meet considerably different needs. Independently of them, John wrote a gospel of a different kind for still another set of reasons. All of this, we believe, was orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. None of the gospels supersedes the others. Each stands beside the others as equally valuable, equally authority. These books, which tell us virtually all we know about Jesus, are not biographies, although they are partly biographical. They are, to use the phrase of Justin Martyr, the memoirs of the apostles. A clear understanding of the Gospels therefore requires us to think both in terms of the historical setting of Jesus and in terms of the historical setting of the authors. Historical context, first of all, has to do with Jesus himself. This includes an awareness of the culture and the religion of the first century Palestinian Judaism in which he lived and taught, as well as an attempt to understand the particular context of a given saying or parable. But historical context also has to do with the individual authors, their reason for writing. It is imperative to the understanding of Jesus that you immerse yourself into the first century Judaism which he was a part. It is equally important to understand the different forms of Jesus' teaching. Every Moabud knows that Jesus frequently taught in parables, but he also used hyperbole, proverbs, similes, metaphors, poetry, questions, and irony, just to name a few. Now, as you read the Gospels, one of the questions you will want to ask is whether Jesus' audience for a given teaching was his close disciples, their larger crowds, or even his opponents. It is commonly understood that Mark wrote to the Romans, Matthew to the Jews, Luke to the Greeks, and John to the Christian churches. Matthew is the gospel of the king. Mark is the gospel of Christ in action. Luke is the gospel of a perfect man. John is the gospel of the son of God. So you've got four gospels, and understand that these, these aren't bi biographies, even though they are biographical, they are the memoirs of the apostles. And each one was written to a specific group. That's why there are some differences, not contradictions, okay? Get this in mind. These aren't contradictions. Even though there are some elements left out of some of the Gospels, it's because it wasn't important to the group they're writing to. So Matthew was writing to the Jews, so he presents Christ as the Messiah. Mark was writing to the Romans, so Mark is a shorter book, but it deals with action because the Romans are men of actions. Luke again writes to a, another, another group, and John to the other group. So some of it is repetitive, some of it is different, and some people say, well, look, look, at, look at the contradictions. Uh, Matthew said this, uh, Luke said this. No, it's not a contradiction. They're looking at it from a different angle. I've used the example before. I, I learned this years ago, and I think I shared it once before that each one of us can have a meeting somewhere with anyone, no matter who it is, and yet if each one was interviewed, we'd tell a different story because we saw it through different eyes. The example was given of, 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 the, of, the, of the blind men taken to an elephant. One was taken to the, to the leg, one was taken to the tail, another was taken to the trunk, another was taken to the, the side. Four blind men, the same animal, and yet if you ask these men what it was was there, they'd each give you a different description. The one that leg, well, this was a, it's a huge tree. Or the wiggling trunk was a large snake. The tail would be like a rope. Or the side was like a, a brick wall. Each one tells a different story, but each one was correct. And so we need to understand the Gospels like that because their stories were given to a different group of people, so they threw it through different eyes. And there are some of the stories where they don't include everything, they include what's important to that group of people. So there are no contradictions in the New Testament, none, okay? You gotta understand they're, they're looking at it through different eyes. That's why we have the importance of uh, four different gospels. 
which gives us a full picture of everything Christ, Christ does and says. Comprende? That's my Spanish for today. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to take a break right there, because then next week we're going to pick up... Uh, with the, oh yeah, we're going to pick up with the prophets, and we don't have too many more pages to go. Prophets, and we'll go into the proverbs and whatnot, and the difference of that. So uh, then we'll get back to our to our, uh, our our minor prophets in the Old Testament, picking up with Hosea and some of these shorter books. And I encourage you, if you have time, to start reading these these minor prophets and uh, find out everything you can about some of these prophets, like Hosea, Nahum, and Habakkuk, Micah, and, and uh, find out a little about them because. Uh, you needed to understand who they were uh, and who they were talking to to understand the messages there. So uh, we're going to take time to go to prayer. So I'm going to stop the video this time.